We are eight weeks away from the South African general elections and political parties have been hitting the ground running with preparations and campaigns for the big day. However, it has not been a smooth journey for some with challenges, uh, you know, candidate registrations, party registrations uh, with the Independent Electoral Commission, among other issues, you know, threatening to stop their political hopes uh, dead in their tracks. Bahai Tudumelang, good evening. My name is Tabo Mulukwani. Welcome to this edition of Soweto Today. Tonight we discuss the challenges uh, that political parties have faced with the Independent Electoral Commission with regards to party and candidate uh, registrations. Joining us to kickstart the conversation is the Economic Liberators Forum of South Africa's president, that's Hulisani Mani, to unpack the latest as far as ELFSA and the IEC are concerned. He's joining us in studio this evening. Mr Mani, much appreciated for coming in. No, thank you very much. Greetings to you and the viewers. Much appreciated. Uh, uh, welcome to the show. Um, uh, uh, let's start uh, briefly by just talking about your party. What is ELFSA and also what you stand for as a party for those that uh, do not know you? No, thank you very much. Economic Liberators Forum South Africa was founded in 2015, which is eight years ago. When we founded it then, we started it as a, as a forum that was solely focused on organizing businesses. Because we realized that we're all in Gauteng, but they, there's actually a lot of poverty. But when we left our rural provinces, we were told that we're going to a city of gold. Yeah. Then we realized there is actually more poverty than the gold that we promised. That was when we started to then want to organize businesses so that we're able to open doors of opportunities that they're unable to tap into because they were not organized. Mm. Uh, then, then late last year, around September, that was when we decided to say we're going to register it as a political party. That was when we faced some couple of challenges with the IEC, where there was an objection raised by the EFF, which was even raised before we were gazetted. Uh, and we feel that that objection was not even supposed to be entertained, because Section 16 is very clear to say, once we gazette, people have 14 days to object. So an objection was sent to, to, to the IEC long be, before we yeah. even did our gazette, which, which, which was issued out in December. Mm. our gazette mm. but the objection was on the 26th of october a, a month before so we believe that iec was supposed to just return back that objection which was raised by the eff mm. let's let's talk about uh, this very same um logo uh, uh you, you know uh, you look at how it is uh, uh you know uh, yes it looks different to the eff's logo uh but i you know i, I want to talk about how um what the IEC is saying and also what the objection is saying in terms of this might be able to confuse the voters. As a party, um, why do you think that this won't be a confusion to, to the voters who might think that this is similar to the EFF? No, we can safely say that the logo that the EFF objected to was, the, was a draft logo which we never even submitted to the IEC. The one that we actually submitted to the IEC does not have a fist, yeah. but the objection of the EFF speakers speaks about the fist that is in the log, and that we never submitted to the IEC. Mm -hmm. So basically, they, they objected on what they saw in social media, but not what was formally submitted to, to the IEC. And the literacy level in South Africa is sitting at 95%. Yeah. Uh, I think we must, uh, we must give credit to South Africans. They are able to differentiate between red and green, between L and F, uh, I, I think saying that they will be confused is undermining their intelligence. Mm. Let's talk about where, what is currently happening now with, uh, with, with uh, the case itself. Um, you are going to be launching your manifesto soon, obviously, as, yes. uh, as a party. What is the current situation with you and the IEC? No, I think we are registered mm. as ELFSA. Uh, we've our log everything's approved we've made the required signature plus 60,000 signatures yep. even though it took us three days to get those signatures it shows the massive support that we have within South Africa because we have presence in all the provinces mm. most people thought we're not, we're not going to make it because we only had three days to get all the required signatures and meet all the requirements that were required by the IEC so I can safely say we're registered we're going to be in the ballot uh, if I'm correct, I, th I think we'll be on the first page yeah. of the ballot. I think around number 11 there, just after the EFF. Mm. 
ELF is voted into administration. Uh, we're talking about post um, uh, the, 20, uh, the 29th of May elections. Mm -hmm. What are the promises? What are the changes? I know that we still have a manifesto yes. that you will outline those things. But for people that are really uh, you know, looking forward to supporting you as ELF, what is it that uh, is very key for you as a party, for them, as the public? No, I think the first thing that we need to do is to build uh, an equal society where economically all of us are benefiting. Because from where I'm sitting currently, 30 years later, it's still the minority who are benefiting from this economy, mm. specifically whites and Indians. Uh, if you are to check among blacks and coloreds, uh, we're at a receiving end. And uh, I think when 1994, when people fought for this democracy, was for everyone to have equal access to opportunities. So what we're saying, especially to these um, two groups, blacks and colored, yeah. we say we need to start to build our own economy because from where we're sitting, we own nothing. At some point, I wanted to convince myself that we own the taxi industry. We yeah. don't. Because we don't even produce, manufacture the taxis, all the consumables, mm. the petrol that we're putting, the tires. Uh, we own nothing. Uh, so our, our take is that we need to start building an economy that will be owned by black people and colors because the current economy it is not accommodative to black people because that's why the unemployment rate among blacks is high among colors is high but when you go to indians it's very low and also among the white people is because they've built an economy where they're able to employ each other mm. so it now we're sitting there for 30 years we're told that jobs will be created but the reality is that there's no one who's going to create jobs for black people and colors except black people and colors themselves so what we're saying to South Africans is that we've been sleeping for the past 30 years. This is the best time where we need to organize ourselves and agree that the common enemy is poverty. And we're not going to defeat it as individuals. Mm. Check out the Pakistans, or okay, alleged Pakistans, because everyone who is a spaza shop, we say they're Pakistans. Yeah. But others are from Bangladesh, they're from different corners. When they first came here, they started by selling Amadou vets. Eventually, they took over the industry of spaza shop, which is worth over 150 billion. And how they did it was they work as a collective. So right now we're so divided that we forgot that there's only one enemy, which is poverty. So we're calling South Africa that we need to build our own economy. And how do we do it? Because it's easy to just identify where there's weaknesses. This is what we do. We're saying in a place like Soweto, we have around 355,000 households. Mm. Each household is buying meal a meal there. Each household is buying a cooking oil. Why are we not having a factory owned by people of Soweto that is producing this particular meal meal or cooking oil? We don't want to start very far. Say, let's start with the basics that we're consuming on our daily basis. Come January, all of us who go to Oma Chonis are wanting to buy school uniform. Why are we not having factories that are owned by people of Soweto that is producing these school uniforms? School shoes, we're buying every year. So we have been implanted a, ment a mentality of being consumers. Mm. Not, you know, what we're saying, it is high time that we need to start to produce every little thing that we consume on our daily basis. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, we continue the conversation. Do so stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto Today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. My name is Thabo Molokwane. Now, before the ad break, we were in conversation with the president of the Economic Liberators Forum uh, of South Africa. That's Uli Sanimani. There just to unpack, um, you know, the challenges that they've been facing with the IEC and also uh, just uh, as they will be launching their um, election manifesto sometime next month. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, there's quite a lot of issues that uh, they want to highlight there. Um, he's my guest tonight. Uh, Mr. Mani, much appreciated for staying on. Um, I, I want us to focus on the work that yes. um, um, you do as a party. I mean, uh, a lot of people might say, look, we don't know what do they stand for. Why should we go out there and vote for them? Um, how do you make sure that, uh, you know, the very large number of young people uh, that are skeptical of going to the polls come 29th of May. Go out there, you know, just take uh, next to your name. I think the first thing that we can say is to urge South African youth to say reality is that the, the future of this country is in our hands. And as this generation, we need to, to really define ourselves. It's either we're going to stand and just watch when this government is going down mm -hmm. or we're going to do something about it. One of the first steps that the Constitution uh, allows us is a uh, right to vote. If they are not able with the current government, they must vote them out. Yeah. And as Economic Liberator was saying, what well, the only hope, because I, I, I can simply say I'm the youngest presidential candidate in these current elections. Yeah. Initially, it was uh, 
who arrived, the, the, the president who arrived South Africa was the youngest, but yeah, Mpodagata. Mpodagata, because yeah. he's 28, I'm 36. Due to some technicalities, they didn't make it to the ballot, yeah. which makes me the youngest. But I'm not celebrating, I'm just stating the facts. Yeah. So I'm saying young people can easily relate to us, but I think what, what can drive young people to have interest on us is that we do have a solution to address our current challenges. And uh, one of the things that we're advocating for is that we must be able to provide young people with short skills. Yeah. Like you have a young person who did, let's say, a particular degree, has been unemployed for five years. They don't have time to go and study another degree. But we need to give them specific skills. If like, if we want to teach young people to be able to, pro to, 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 to take care of a chicken farm that produces eggs, they must just go to school, be trained for that three weeks, just to, to, to get a particular skill. Yeah. If a person wants to fix cars and they want to learn how to, to fix a gearbox, they must just go be taught how to fix a gearbox, how to fix tires. So that because in reality that people do not have time to go back to school for, 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 for another full period. So mm -hmm. what we're saying, we need to be able to introduce short skills to those who are already graduates. But those who are still young, we need to encourage them to do relevant programs. Because currently government is finding, uh, example, you find a person doing an HR. Yeah. When we know very well that there's only a demand of less than around 1,000 new HR office, officers per year. But you are training over 20,000 HR students. So that means clearly you are planning that over 19,000 must go and sit home and be unemployable. So we are saying any, uh, any, uh, any qualification that is offered, it must be aligned with the demand in the market. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about your view of the nation as a party. Um, as ELF, uh, SA, what is your view of the country in general? Uh, given all the challenges that we face, given maybe let's say the good things that have happened over the past few years and the bad things, but from ELF, SA, your view of the nation, where are we as a country? No, I think as a country, uh, the ruling party have tried, but I think they've run out of ideas to take their country forward. They've given us, given us the, 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 the democracy, but what we need now is an economic liberation. Mm -hmm. As much as people are given economic freedom, uh, political freedom. So what we're saying now, we need to be able to create a state and an economy that is going to be able to benefit everyone who lives in South Africa. Because currently it is benefiting the few. But then the question is, how do we then do it? we need to be able to start to be organized and work as a collective. Because the reality is that as long as we're divided, we're not going to be able to hold government accountable. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that have degenerated is, that, is the state capacity. Uh, the reason why there's no service delivery, things are not going, uh, the, the state machinery has collapsed is because they've put wrong people uh, in right positions. Mm. Like you find, because we are using cadre deployment. Uh, people are, are, are deployed on critical services like water. The entire infrastructure of water in South Africa is collapsing. Uh, you, you have a place like Bembe where you have a village like uh, Chisau, uh, Riverside. They have not had water for over seven years. You go to a place like uh, Didid. Yeah. I'm told the last time they had water it was in 2010. So, uh, and those are the things that media is not covering. We're saying, because when you're in Kauteng, water goes for two weeks. It yeah. makes headlines. But you have a place that they've not had water for over 10 years. So I say it can't be that after 30 years we're still discussing issue of, of access to basic services. Mm. So those are the things that you know, the minute we enter, we're going to sort those things out. It can't be a manifesto to give people water. It can't be a manifesto to give people access to houses. Those are things that must just be done. Let's talk about the issue of education, basic education, you know, to be specific. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, there's been critics before that uh, the issue of 30% is actually not doing good to the country. Because now you see young people go out there, finish matric 30%, and then that's it. They can't go anywhere because universities will reject them. Mm. No, I think the entire educational system that we're giving to our people is not assisting because a person goes to school for 12 years. When they're done with that 12 years, or if they happen to drop out in grade 11, they know nothing. Mm. It becomes 11 years of waste. So I'm saying, as much as uh, uh, what we must do is to make sure that our people in the 12 years of basic education, they must be able to acquire certain skills. So that even if you end at a grade 10, you must have a particular skill that is yeah. going to help you to survive. So the, the current educational system is not equipping young people to be able to survive under these under, under this economic hardships. But a person who is a grade 10 from Zimbabwe come to South Africa and be able to survive. But South Africans, they can't. The minute they drop out or they have their metric, if they are not, uh, they are not admitted to invest, they go sit in, in corners, they, they, they become your addicts. It is because we, we have gave them nothing for the past 12 years. Mm. So I say, 
in every program that we do in basic education, when a person is done with their metric, they must get out with a particular skill that can help them to survive, whether they proceed or not. Just lastly, before I let you go, um, are you confident that you're going to do well in these upcoming elections? Uh, I always tell my colleagues, Guti, ELFSA is going to be the dark horse. Yeah. That is going to, to actually shock the country. Or how did we make it? Because I can safely tell you we're going to have more than 10 seats there in that parliament. And we'll be the ones who decide who's going to rule this country mm -hmm. with the tenses that we're going to be having plus. Ulisani Mani, much appreciated for coming in. Always a pleasure having you. No, thank you very much. That was uh, the ELF SA president, Ulisani Mani, there unpacking uh, you know, their plans as a party. As we know that they will be launching uh, the uh, manifesto in May uh, as we are heading to the elections on the 29th of May. We're going to take a quick ad break. When we come back, uh, we speak to the IEC and just to get a sense of exactly what is going on with this back and forth with uh, some political parties. Do stay where you are. We come back after this. Welcome back. You're still watching Soweto today. Thank you for choosing to stay with us. We're getting closer to the end of the show and we've been in conversation on the challenges that political parties such as ELF SA have faced with the Independent Electoral Commission, including also what's been happening with the MK party. Now we shift gears to hear from the IEC on their stance on uh, some of the issues raised as well as uh, to have them educate us on the processes and procedures. Now joining us to have this conversation is IEC Outreach and Communications Manager Peter Moses who's joining us in studio this evening. Mr. Moses, much appreciated for coming in. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you and uh, thank you for inviting me. Much appreciated. I mean, um, you know, we've been seeing quite a lot of issues uh, in the run-up to the elections. I mean, ELF uh, SA before they rebranded to ELF SA, mm -hmm. it was ELF only, and yes. then um, you know there were objections, um, you know, from the uh, EFF saying that look, this logo looks similar to ours and 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 stuff. So uh, the issue also of M MK Party, we heard the IEC also just saying that look, um, um, one of your uh, candidates, uh, there was an objection that was raised that uh, the person. Um, also cannot um, contest the elections as a result of what the law says. Um, maybe if you can take us through uh, these challenges. Normally what happens when um, political parties have logos that are similar and there is an objection and also if someone is found to have, uh, you know, um, can't be able to contest because of uh, what the law says, particularly looking at um, the issue of, uh, you know, if you've been sentenced to more than 12 months in prison. No, that's fine. Uh, maybe uh, let's start first with the issue of uh, registration of a party. Uh, or in specifically the issue of ELF. Yeah. Uh, rather than just speaking in general terms. Uh, the law requires the IC to determine if a, a party that is intending to register as a political party, if its a name, a abbreviation, and logos are not similar to those of a, a, a registered party already on the system, because that it would con it will confuse uh, voters. Mm. Now, even before an objection is made, that that party that has been uh, been uh, uh, registered or have applied for registration. Uh, has got the logos that are similar to those of uh, their, uh, you know, an existing party. Even before a person makes that objection, the law requires for the IEC to make that determination. So the IEC would then, when you submit, it will check on your systems if your name, abbreviation, and logo does, is not uh, the same of any other party to the extent that it can confuse voters and, uh, and uh, is uh, maybe intended to deceive voters to think that uh, uh, if they have a logo, a party, a new party, if it's got a logo and a name, in, a name similar to an, an established party, maybe a famous party, then mm -hmm. the people would be confused at the voting station when they look at the a ballot paper, may vote for them uh, unintentionally. So the law requires that the IC must make sure that that does not happen. So it will reject uh, your application if for those, uh, that criteria is not met, even before an objection is laid. Let's talk about this issue of, uh, um, you know, MK. Um, I know we, we are discussing the ELF issue and stuff, but uh, I, I, I mean, you know, 
they have uh, you know um, uh, filed papers to the electoral court um, you know on the issue of uh, removing the former president Jacob Zuma who is part of uh, the uh, MK party they they are saying that the IEC doesn't have jurisdiction to remove someone from the list uh, maybe if you can explain it for us normally what happens if a person is removed from the list yeah if uh, uh, you don't qualify in terms of the constitution uh, to stand uh, in an election to be a candidate in an election and if elected to hold public office uh, specifically in this instance in terms of section 47 e mm. uh, the ic is a duty bound to implement that uh, 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 section of the law however the issue may just be in terms of uh, interpretation. Yeah. Our interpretation, which was uh, 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 that the the candidate in question does not qualify, it was uh, it, it was based on an objection that was submitted, and that objection was uh, upheld by the IC. Now that pa the party is, is within its own rights to then approach the inter uh, electoral, uh, electoral court, court yeah. to determine if our interpretation of the law. Is correct. Now the electoral court will then make a determination next week, and all of us then would be much wiser as to whether we were correct in our interpretation or the uh, party that has uh, appealed our our interpretation of the law uh, was correct. So we would know that uh, next week. Mm. What makes a party um, get deregistered? Uh, you know, maybe if, for instance, say, um, you know, we we saw. Um, instances whereby um, so some parties could not meet certain uh, requirements that uh, the IEC had set up. Um, we, we look at the, the, the parties such as um, um, Arise Mzanti, it did not make the cut, but it was not deregistered. Uh, normally, on the issue of deregistration, if a party becomes deregistered, uh, what would have happened? Yeah, if uh, the party uh, contravenes uh, the law as it states, as it stands, mm. it, uh, you know, as the IC we are by law required to deregister the party, one of the things would be if the constitution of the party at the point when it was registered uh, would have uh, uh, was in line with the law. And over time, that constitution has changed. You know, things like maybe in the party constitution, they say we don't uh, uh, accept certain uh, people of a particular sex, particular race, particular sexual orientation or religion. If a party then has uh, as, uh, uh, their constitution uh, uh, says they don't accept people on those grounds, then it means it will have to be re deregistered because that would be uh, against the constitution. Mm. But Just, uh, yeah, on yeah. The, yeah, on the issues of uh, uh, parties uh, contesting elections, particularly these elections, if a party has not contested the national ballot uh, for the national assembly and at least one regional ballot, uh, in the National Assembly, that party will not be able to contest either of the two uh, uh, ballots in the National Assembly. It must at least contest uh, uh, the National Assembly at least, and uh, uh, contest at least one regional. Uh, 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 by regional, we mean a province, a provincial seat in the yeah. National Legislature. So it must contest that at least one provi a provincial seat in the National Assembly. Uh, and the National Assembly for it to stand in the National Assembly. If it does not contest uh, in terms of those uh, that criteria, it will it will not be allowed to contest in the National Assembly. Very interesting indeed. Uh, just lastly, before I let you go, because we are running out of time. Um, y yesterday we saw um, you know the IC um, inviting all the political parties to come and sign um, you know the code of conduct there. How important is that document? I mean, uh, previously we've seen quite a lot of people making uh, statements that uh, you know uh, the IC would deem not. Uh, uh, how do I put it? Statements that are wrong in the public domain. Uh, but I know that the IC, obviously, within the Code of Conduct, they're trying to make sure that people are adhering to the standard and practices of what's happening during the elections. How important is that document? You know, it's very important uh, that uh, we publicize the pledge by political parties to uh, subscribe to the Electoral Code of Conduct. 
because once an election has been uh, declared, parties must comply uh, in their actions in terms of what the electoral co uh, code of conduct uh, uh, ascribes to them. So that's a public pledge which ordinarily they would have signed when they registered as political parties. Because if mm -hmm. you do not subscribe to the electoral code of conduct and you don't make a pledge that you're going to conduct yourselves within the remit of the law, uh, you will not be able to participate in elections. Mr. Moses, much appreciated. Uh, we'll definitely have you uh, as we are heading to the elections uh, soon. Much appreciated for coming in this okay. evening. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you for uh, inviting me. That was uh, Peter Moses, the Independent Electoral Commission's Outreach and Community Manager, giving us an understanding on what has been happening with the parties who have experienced registration challenges, as well as uh, the general criteria and processes to be followed at the IEC. Thank you to my earlier guests there as well, Mr. Hulisani Mani, from the president of the ELFSA, who came through to give us clarity on what has been happening within their party and their upcoming plans, as we know that they will be launching their manifesto next month. That's how we wrap up today's episode of Soweto Today. Remember, we love hearing from you. So please feel free to engage with us. Uh, send us an email at Soweto Today at SowetoTV.co.za. You can call or WhatsApp us at 081-531-8857. For myself, Tabo Mulukwani, and the rest of the team, good night, and thank you for watching. Stay with us for your latest news updates with Mas Chabakobola coming up next.